It's my privilege today. It's my honor to welcome back to the Daily Signal podcast, Yael Eckstein. Yael serves as president and CEO of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. Yael, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me on. It's an honor. You live in Israel. Talk a little bit about how you're doing personally, how your community is doing, and how people in your community are are coping amid the ongoing war right now. Wow. Well, I think as far as how anyone is doing here in Israel, it's from minute to minute. Um, I am very aware and listening for the sirens, in which case I would have to leave this interview and go to my bomb shelter and come back in a few minutes. Um, always know where my children are. None of the kids in Israel had school already for over 10 days. Um, and so we've been going between life, whatever that looks like, in our bomb shelter. For me, it's working around the clock. I look at uh, my work with International Fellowship of Christians and Jews as, as my service to my country right now. And we've seen even in the past 11 days how it's saved so many lives in a tangible way. So I, I guess we're all going between extreme grief and extreme Dream gratitude. The grief is both personal. We just had a funeral of somebody from our community um, just two hours ago, someone, a, a teenager who was killed at the festival, dance festival uh, that happened last Saturday where they were targeted by terrorists. Um, everyone has someone who was kidnapped, killed, who they know, who they feel close to. So as a country, on one hand, an extreme grief, but there's also a feeling of gratitude that um, there's a unity in Israel that I've never experienced. And people abroad who are standing with Israel and finally understand kind of our uh, predicament and the evil that we're fighting and how uh, we are fighting for our survival, just that voice of support has been so inspiring. Mm. You mentioned those <laughs> sirens. How many times a day are you hearing them usually? Wow. So it matters where you are in Israel. And uh, my staff is in every city in Israel. We have staff and volunteers, of course, down south right now. Um, so for them, it's every few minutes. As they're going bomb shelter to bomb shelter delivering food, um, they're seeing elderly who haven't left the bomb shelter in 11 days, that their only way to get food and water is by our volunteers going. But our volunteers are going with bulletproof vests and helmets and find themselves often in the middle of attacks as they're completely vulnerable. Where I am in central northern Israel, it's um, it's not as often, uh, but it's often enough that my bomb shelter is ready with water and we are there too often to feel comfortable with. I was on a call yesterday with uh, leaders of the humanitarian work happening now in Israel, along with different government officials. And we started off with a call of around 16 people. And in the middle, there were sirens going off across Israel that there were only three or four people left on the Zoom call. So it's just become a part of our reality. Mm. For those who aren't familiar, talk a little bit about the work of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. You've mentioned taking food to those who are in bomb shelters, supplies, but explain what your mission is. Well, the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews is the largest organization in Israel. Um, we focus on three specific areas. One is uh, welfare and poverty. So that's basic needs of bringing food to the hungry, clothing to the naked. We bring uh, medicine to the elderly. We focus on immediate basic needs for the poorest populations. Uh, the second area is security. So we've built over 3,000 bomb shelters. We provide uh, first responders kits to uh, people on the front lines, bulletproof ambulances, bulletproof vehicles, which actually um, in the attack last Saturday saved the lives of every single security official on the Gaza border, wow. except for one who was killed when he was not in the uh, bulletproof vehicle that the fellowship provided. Um, and the third is Aliyah, that we take Jews from at-risk locations and bring them to Israel. So for example, Ukraine and across the former Soviet Union. Um, so we've definitely been focused on in the past 11 days um, on 
uh, mobilizing the infrastructure that we've built over the past 40 years, that we have our partners on the ground, our soup kitchens in every single city, um, our security leaders. We don't work directly with aid for uh, military aid for the Israeli army, of course, but it's that civil side of the firefighters who are volunteering now to go and put out fires when homes are hit by rockets, but they're doing it under rocket attack. And so we're providing them with the bulletproof vests, um, anything we could do to help protect the people, which um, it also should be recognized as, is is mostly Jews, but not all Jews. Israel is 21% non-Jews, Muslims, Bedouin, Druze, um, who are targeted the same way as the Jewish people here. How big mm-hmm. is your team? I mean, as you list off all the things that you're doing, it sounds like it would take an army to do all of that. Well, uh, we are, uh, I would say, the leaders in um, creating partnerships. And so last year in 2022, uh, the fellowship helped over 2 million people. And we have a staff in Israel that's responsible for that of under 70 people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we have a huge network of volunteers and we really utilize um, uh, all the government officials on the ground. For example, there are municipal social workers and there's the Ministry of Welfare and they're the one that actually have the data on the people who need it most. And so the fellowship has a system where we create the criteria for everyone that we want to help. And then we work in partnership with the government who has the data for that so that we can be most effective and um, strategic and pinpoint pointed in the aid that we need. For example, one of our flagship programs is called Indignity and Fellowship, where uh, we identified the 17,000 uh, poorest elderly in Israel. And we created criteria that they're over 80 years old. They live on under $1,000 a month. They don't have family support. The government gave us a list of who meets those criteria. And then they came into the fellowships program where we said, we're bringing you food and volunteers every week for the rest of your life. And so uh, it's an incredible program. We, we become their family. Christians and Jews around the world become their family. Um, and so we've obviously been in touch with with our with our uh, recipients of this aid um, since the war began. And we already have many in this program who have been killed. A few who have even been kidnapped and are now in Gaza. So. Um, When you talk about kind of the infrastructure that's set up, the partnership that we have, it's worked incredibly up until now in, you know, under 70 staff being able to distribute aid to over 2 million people in the most effective way possible. But what we're seeing now is that the responders have become the victim. So there's been a need to create a whole new line of uh, aid distribution in the past 11 days. Yeah, I I did want to ask you about the hostages. I think that's something I know it's been on my mind constantly uh, and on so many Americans' minds. Um, You mentioned that that you do know some of those who have been taken hostage. How are you processing that? And how are are both those in Israel and, and specifically with the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews processing that, praying for those who have been taken hostage? Wow. So Israel is a country who cherishes life, and our enemies know that. They um, kidnapped many years ago, you might remember the name Gilad Shalit, who was prayed for and spoken about all around the world because he was one captured soldier in the Gaza Strip, and we did everything to get him back. And now they have over 200 elderly babies, children, women, handicapped. It's something that's I mean, unfathomable. And when you try to think about it, I, I, for me personally, when I think about it, I just can't stop crying. Um, to imagine these little children, how who's putting them to sleep at night? Who's feeding them? Who's waking up in the morning with them when it's just too much to handle? And I think it shows that the enemy Israel is fighting right now is the Nazis. When people talk about what's the proportionate response, I mean, even ISIS didn't do things like this. And Israel is fighting a war for our survival that I think what the world sees right now is when Israel's enemies are gathering weapons and saying in their mandate that it's to wipe Israel off the map and kill every man, woman, and child, we have to take that seriously. And so um, the fellowship is doing everything we can. For example, there is a, a, a makeshift tent that the Homefront Command set up where they're bringing all of the bodies, 
over 1,300 bodies that have been recovered are being brought to there for their family to recognize and identify them. And so there are families there, sometimes for days on end. It's still happening now, day 11 of the war, and there's still families there waiting to identify their loved ones. And so the fellowship and coordination with the government of Israel, they asked us to just set up a tent with chairs and mattresses, phone chargers, food, uh, water, basics. And so we set that up on day one. We're now day 11. It's going to be open for at least another week. And we have uh, volunteers there day and night, 24-7, over the weekend, three in the morning, just being there for the families and telling them that they're not alone. Wow. How is morale in in Israel right now? Um, Right now, I feel like the people of Israel are living, if I had to give one word, living in a paradox. On one hand, we are as broken as I can ever remember the people of Israel being. And on the other hand, we are stronger than we've ever been. On one hand, we have this extreme grief that, like we said, everyone knows someone who is killed. Everyone knows someone who is kidnapped. We're a country the size of New Jersey with 10 million citizens. I mean, this the effect of this, I read um, that if you take per capita what happened in America on 9-11, this is over 25 times that atrocity and that personal to the people of Israel. And so, um, and, and so the people of Israel are both an extreme grief and extreme gratitude because we're seeing our friends, we're seeing our neighbors come and help with whatever is needed. We're seeing our um, friends abroad, Muslims, Christians, everyone that you could imagine, people who aren't religious at all look at Israel and say, oh, I get it, I stand with them. There have been so many Muslims in Israel, one of actually the most public ones, Nas Daily, if you follow it, um, who said, okay, so I used to be um, Arab Israeli. I am now Israeli Arab. I'm Israeli first. I want to live under an Israeli government. I don't want to live under that. And so I think there's this kind of awakening that sometimes when you put a mirror in front of people's faces, I, I feel God saying, I lay before you life and death, choose life. What side are you standing on? You you can no longer be neutral. Um, if you believe there are good people on both sides, which of course there are, then freeing the Gaza Strip from terror Hamas rule, you're doing a favor to those innocent Palestinians as well. And so I just feel like everyone is realizing what's life, who stands for life, what's death, who stands for death, what's light and what's darkness. And so I think that's giving Israel, on one hand, a lot of strength that, okay, our mission is clear, the world stands behind us, and it's also terrifying when you finally realize what the price of, God forbid, losing is. It's one that you can't afford. Yeah. When you're watching the mainstream media coverage of what is happening in Israel between Israelites and and Hamas, what do you think the mainstream media is missing in their reporting? Hmm. Wow. So I'm not a, a political expert by any means. As far as politics, I'm the same as any other regular person who's who's following and watching. I'm I'm an expert in humanitarian aid. I'm an expert in building systems during times of crisis to distribute that humanitarian aid. Um, I'm an expert in partnerships and immediate mobilization in order to save lives during crisis. Um, and, and so I think that as, as somebody who cherishes life and dedicates my life to this humanitarian uh, plight of everyone in Israel, um, all of the innocent people and, and distributing aid dependent on the needs, period, um, I would say that, that what's being missed in so many ways is just how deep Israel has these values of cherishing life, Mm -hmm. how deep Israel is um, fighting for freedom in a sense that whoever doesn't get behind it is simply on the side of darkness. There is no moral equivalency here. I was watching an interview where someone said, um, do you think that Israel is using disproportionate measures? And the person said, well, we try, we, we, we would have tried if you were very into proportionate measures to find a music festival in the Gaza Strip where there were young people dancing, but that doesn't exist. And we refuse to go and take innocent captives. So regarding proportionate measures, 
we're seeking out the Hamas terrorists and we'll do anything to wipe them out. And I think that within all of the noise is the most important thing to realize. Mm -hmm. Israel is seeking out the terrorists. Israel is seeking out those who seek to destroy us. And we won't stop until it's done. And it won't be a one or two day fight. And unfortunately, those terrorists are hiding in hospitals, in UN schools, underneath civilian buildings. And so I think it's important for people to realize in Israel, we're watching this with just as much heartbreak as you are. We don't want the loss of civilian lives, but we cannot handle anymore living our cities less than half a mile from Hamas terrorists. Yeah. What do you think, just seeing a little bit in, in historical context, um, what would be a couple of things that specifically Americans really need to understand about the history between the Jews and the Palestinians? Well, I think every single war that Israel's ever fought has been one in response to being attacked. In 1948, we were given a tiny sliver of land to live side by side with uh, the our Muslim neighbors, and we accepted it. We were attacked within one day. In 1967, we weren't occupiers of Jerusalem or any... And we were attacked by uh, numerous, every single uh, Arab army surrounding us, and miraculously, we won. We are in a fight for our survival that Israel has always been happy with the tiny sliver of land that we have. And yet, that tiny sliver of land has always been a source of... Um, a source of conflict for our neighbors that simply don't want the Jewish people here. My family also goes back 11 generations in Jerusalem. I think it's important for people to realize there's always been a Jewish presence in Israel. Going back to biblical times, there's never not been a Jewish presence. In the same way as before 1948, there was the British Empire, there was the Ottoman Empire. There's been Jews living here throughout that. So um, as Pre President Biden said the other day, and as we learned very clearly after the Holocaust, as the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor from Germany whose family was all wiped out in Auschwitz, we have nowhere else to go. <laughs> we're not just fighting for the survival of uh, the people here. We're fighting for the survival of the Jewish people. We don't have any other country. We have one sliver of land the size of New Jersey that has almost half the world's Jewish population here. We have nowhere else to go. Hmm. Yale, tell us how we should be praying right now for those across the world who support Israel, who are standing with, with Israel who want to do something and who are followers of Jesus, how do we pray? Well, I think the first thing to realize is we all want to see the good. Love your neighbor like yourself. We want to love. We want to see the good. And it's so important to live our lives in that in that respect of, of seeing the good in the world and being, as we say in Hebrew, giving the benefit of the doubt. But we also have a biblical verse that says, Hashem sinura, lovers of the Lord despise evil. And right now we are seeing evil. I believe that we are in redemptive times and the end of days. And I believe that was happening now. God is saying, you can't say you didn't know what was good and what was bad. You can't say that you didn't know what was happening to the Jewish people. And so I think right now we have to follow that biblical mandate, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This, these are the scriptures that are uh, the roots of Christianity. Of course, Jesus lived in Jerusalem. These were his people. These are the words that he studied. And as Christians who believe that they are grafted onto the rich olive tree of Israel, um, I think it's so important to, to realize this isn't just a fight on the Jews in Israel. This isn't just a fight about land. This is a spiritual war, and we have to um, respond accordingly. I believe in any spiritual war, it's, uh, it's responding with the prayers of our lips and the prayers of our hands. The prayers of our lips have to be um, for the safety, of course, of uh, all innocent people. But I think right now is the time to focus on Israel and Israel's survival, to look at those scriptures that tell us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, to pray for God's children, to knock out the evil that wants to destroy 
pray God's children, which is God's word. Um, and to pray with our feet is also now the time that the people of Israel are in need. So much of our first responders' gear have been destroyed by these terrorists. Ambulances have been stolen and brought back into the Gaza Strip. There are people who are in their bomb shelters for 11 days already waiting for food. I think it's the prayer of the lips and look at the scriptures for how you should pray for Israel and Jerusalem. Yeah. And then there's also the prayer of action, which is needed now more than ever. Your website is ifcj.org, standing for International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. What is your biggest need right now? How can we support you? Thank you so much. The biggest need is what the fellowship is always focused on, is that we look in the scriptures and God says, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, shelter the poor, focus on the widows and the orphans, which unfortunately now the numbers of widows and orphans has grown um, substantially in the past 11 days. And so that's where we are. We're in the basic needs for survival. Um, and and I believe that um, the message when the fellowship delivers that food to the bomb shelter, or uh, is there to comfort the family who's waiting to identify the body of their loved ones? There was just a mother um, and her 10-year-old uh, daughter. They were at our uh, center that we set up at the place where you identify the bodies. They were there for five days straight. The mother refused to leave. Her husband and her son were both killed. Her husband, her husband wasn't identified till just a day or two ago. Her son was identified immediately and her and her 10 year old daughter, she said, we are not leaving until we identify my husband's body. Mm -hmm. And for five days, she was there with our staff and with food and with everything they needed to play with the child, to love the child, to bring the child's favorite meal to the center. And when we said that this is donated from Christians around the world who love you and stand with you, what I'm saying is I don't know if the food is bringing them more life or just that message of not being alone. Wow. So powerful. Yale Eckstein, the president and CEO of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. Again, the website is ifcj.org. We'll put that in our show notes. Yale, thank you so much for your time today. Our hearts and our prayers are with you, with those on your team who are serving. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And to everyone listening and caring and praying, may God bless you. 